I have to say amen to that uh, comment on the uh, beautiful repast that we just enjoyed. That was outstanding. Of course, it's always excellent. The ladies here and the men that participate in it all have always done a super job. And this is probably going to be about a 10-15 pound meeting. You know, we measure meetings by how much weight we put on. So this is probably at least a 10 pounder, maybe a 15 by the time it's over with. That makes a good sized bass. If you've ever been bass fishing. Waking people up reminded me of a comment Brother G.K. Wallace made one time. Brother Wallace, uh, toward the end of his life, had been placed in a nursing home in Winter Haven. And I had the good fortune to be able to go over and visit with him. You could just mention a name and he would go off and tell you a bunch of stories about some of these old preachers. And he was talking about holding a meeting one time with Brother Basil Doran was doing the, who was a great song leader and gospel preacher of many years ago, was doing the singing, leading the singing. And uh, Brother Wallace got up to speak and he looked out and there were about five or six people already asleep in the audience. And Brother Doran says, well, Brother Wallace, you have to wake them up. Brother Wallace says, I only wake up those I put to sleep. He said, Brother Doran, you put those to sleep, you get them. <laughs> so if you're already asleep, you were asleep before I got up here. Now, I'll take the blame for those that follow. But in, uh, it's really a great pleasure to be with you. And I'd like to direct your attention this evening, or this afternoon actually, uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul writing to the great church at Corinth in the province of Achaia in ancient Greece says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Contextually, he was speaking of, of course, the miraculous gifts that were available to the church back then. Uh, the, those gifts being listed, uh, nine of those gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, specifically for the church at Corinth. Paul was planning to impart another gift unto them. We're not specifically told uh, what that would entail. But again, I believe he's talking about the miraculous or some miraculous benefaction that God had in mind and that was needful for the church at Corinth. Keep in mind that in the first century they did not have the written revelation of God's Word, but rather they had the Word in inspired men. And those men preached and taught the Word of God by the impulsion of the Holy Spirit and uh, in order to demonstrate that that was indeed a message from God, they had to perform, or someone else perform a miracle, that then backed up the preaching. How do we know the difference? Well, back then, someone would preach and another one, or even the one who did the preaching, would then perform a miracle and say, this man is of God, or this, what I have just preached is from God. He could verify it that way. Today we have the written revelation itself, and so we have no need of that. We can go to the book of God and see what God says. If it's not according to the law or to the testimony, then we're not to hear them. We're to uh, not give ear to them, but rather we're to speak all things according to the oracles of God, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. But the principle here is what I am looking at, and the fact that they were indeed enriched. And they were enriched by virtue of this message, the miraculous gifts and what it entailed. We have the written uh, equivalent of that, or actually the written consequent of that in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And in that and to that degree, Christians are the richest people in the world. Brother Michael uh, made the point that I wasn't going to preach on Bill Gates or, uh, or uh, Warren Buffett or any of these characters. I'm going to mention them just briefly, simply as a way of comparison. Suppose you had an opportunity this very hour, and uh, an individual who had the power and right, perhaps uh, Bill Gates himself, were to stroll into this building and state, 
clearly, without equivocation, that the first person through this door I will give my entire fortune to and make you a billionaire overnight. And if you will go through that door and just give up any religious affectations or beliefs or ideas, and you can have everything I have. How many people do you think in the in the world, just say in Pensacola, Florida, if they knew of that and they were told they had to go through this specific door and this is what would be required of, I think we'd have a line going out to the road and down the highway and across town. Be willing to do that. All for what in effect becomes a mess of pottage when you take into consideration eternity. They would be willing to sell their souls, as it were, to become a billionaire. Or in this case, a multi-billionaire. To have everything that they ever wanted as far as this world's goods are concerned. And yet, in doing so, they count themselves really poorer than they really are. You think about it. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 16, he also uses the same language at the close of Mark 8, makes reference to the value of the human soul. He asks the question, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now we're talking about four, five, six billion dollars. I don't know exactly what he's worth now. It's a lot. It's more than a bucket full. I know of a man that killed another man in New York just here a while back for 50 cents. Murdered him on the subway. So some folks will kill for 50 cents. But here we've got several billion dollars are offered. What is a man profited if he shall... Gain the whole world, but lose his own soul. If you could take everything this world has to offer and pile it up in one place, which would be impossible. But if you could, Jesus' point is your soul is more valuable than even that. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. There's nothing of that greater value as far as this physical world, this mundane sphere is concerned, than your soul, or my soul, or the soul of your neighbor, the soul of your family member, the soul of any individual you can possibly mention. The whole world combined, as far as the all the gold, all the silver, all the minerals, all the paper currency, all the property, the paper bonds and stocks, everything you could possibly imagine that you could give any value to of a physical, carnal nature. is not to be compared to the value of the human soul in the sight of God Himself, who is the ultimate valuer of all things. After all, He made it. He's the Creator. And as such, He knows the true value of things. The wealth that Christians possess and Christians alone is found simply and solely in Jesus Christ. That's where it's all been summed up in. This is where the true riches are located according to Luke 16 verse 11. Luke 12 verse 21. Jesus in the parable of the rich farmer said, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, but is not rich toward God. He's talking about the uh, rich farmer there and what a fool he is. In that parable, or at the beginning of the parable, the, the key lesson he is stressing is that we're to beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things he possesses, regardless of how much it is. Verse 15. Would you like to be the richest person in the world? Well, how about it? Would you like to be able to walk with the Rockefellers? To dine with the Descendants of the Carnegies, and so on. Vacation at uh, Pismo Beach or Malibu or Tahiti, and so on, at the ritziest resorts. 
despite all of the value that the Vanderbilts, the Gettys, the Rockefellers, all put together, including the current bunch of, of misfits that have amassed fortunes, all of their wealth together is not of greater value than your soul this very day. That's a humbling thought. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul writes, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, He became poor for your sakes, that ye through His poverty might be rich. He became poor that through your sakes ye might be rich. Revelation 2 verse 9. Paul, or the, uh, John, writing to the church at Smyrna, says, I know thy works, thy tribulation, and thy poverty. Now watch this. But thou art rich. Physically, financially, monetarily, they were impoverished. The Laodiceans were rich and had need of nothing, or at least that's what they thought, physically speaking. And he says, But thou knowest not that thou art poor, wretched, miserable, and blind. You know what's fascinating about the language the Lord uses concerning the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3? Is that every one of those Greek terms stress, stress the idea of total impoverishment. I mean, he was getting down to the nitty gritty. You think you are well to do. You think you are well off. And you don't even know that you are as destitute as destitute comes. Spiritually speaking. And I've often asked this question and wondered, when you have congregations in a city and someone moves in, and they start looking for congregation or congregation to work in worship, what do they generally take into consideration? What do they start looking for? One of the first things they take into consideration what kind of building they've got. Brother Guy in Woods said one time he went to hold a meeting and uh, he was picked up and, uh, at the airport, which was rarely for Brother Woods. He often he preferred to, to drive than fly. He hated dry, uh, flying. But he was picked up and the brother that picked him up took him by the church building and said, we put on a new steeple this year this year, and it's higher than the Baptist. That was what they were the proudest of, was that high steeple. People look at the building. Or they look at how much money is being put into this or that as far as uh, entertainment aspect of a congregation. And they start counting up how many doctors how many lawyers? How many millionaires? And who are, where are the well-to-do people? Where do they attend? And I've often wondered, that this question has crossed my mind, what would they have done if they had Smyrna on one block and maybe a half mile over was the building at Laodicea? Which church would they be in? I think we know that, do we not? They'd be over at Laodicea. And which of those congregations really is the rich congregation in God's sight? Smyrna. I think we can see that. And this afternoon I want to stress to you the fact that we are indeed, and if we are faithful Christians, we are richer than this world can possibly imagine. And we need to rejoice in that and stress the attractiveness of Christianity and the privileges that God has given us and be thankful for it and be willing to share it with others. To encourage them to enjoy the same blessings and benefits. The Christian is rich because first and foremost he has been pardoned from past sins. Those have been blotted out and he also has provision and promise for future pardon. That alone is of immeasurable importance. As Jesus said, what, you know, if you lose your own soul, what else have you got? What else can you call your own? How many people here, right now, just think about it, I'm not asking for a show of hands, live in the very same home you, grew, you were born in or grew up in? Just think about it. 
Last week, or last month, a couple months ago, I had to sell my mother's home. Last home I ever knew as a boy. Sold it. Painful? Yes. But not unexpected. Something that happens to everybody, one point or another. At some point, we move out, move on, or if somebody comes along and either burns it down, blows it up, tears it down, <laughs> somewhere they disappear. We no longer have it. And quite frankly, the house you live in right now, the likelihood is 30, 40, 50 years from now, it's going to belong to somebody else if it's still standing. It probably won't even be in your family. That's just the nature of things. That's the way life goes. What we have today can be gone tomorrow, and we're seeing people this very hour who are concerned about, indeed all of us to some measure, over the current crisis of economics. And what will, what will be? What's going to happen? How will it affect us? We need to understand that we are still, even though we are destitute even as Lazarus, we reach the case of Lazarus, where we're like the, the poor man lying at the rich man's gate, full of sores and with the dogs licking them. We're still the richest people on earth. And that's the reality of the thing. We have pardon from past sin. Keep in mind that salvation is in Jesus Christ, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. And that it is in Christ we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, 7, Colossians 1, verse 14. Ephesians 1, 7 goes on to say, according to the riches of His grace. Oh yes, we're saved by the grace of God. But it is by the grace of God through the faith of Jesus Christ. The Gospel system, Ephesians 2 verse 8, not of works, that is works of man's own merit, works of our own boasting, not of works lest any man should boast, but keep in mind, there are works that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. In fact, Paul says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which before He has ordained that we should walk in them. Underline that. A lot of folks will read Ephesians 2 and Oh, we're saved by grace through faith. Marvelous. Then they'll say grace only. But what about faith? Oh yeah, we're saved by that too. Well, it's not by grace only. Well, they'll say we're saved by faith only. Well, what about grace? Well, then it's not by faith only. Because grace is involved. Yes, indeed, some works are excluded. Some works are also included. James 2 verse 24. Justified by works. But even in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul implies that there are works involved in our salvation. In fact, keep in mind that these people were God's workmanship, and the word workmanship means literally masterpiece, masterworking. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Keep in mind, they were such where? In Christ. That's a locative construction. Literally, located. We call it locative. But it's a locative construction. Meaning it tells us where we were created. Where we are new creatures. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Romans 6, verses 3 through 5. We're able to walk in newness of life. There's the idea of creation or a new, new being, a new creature. But we're created in, the, in Christ unto good work. But it's in Christ, remember, where we have forgiveness through His blood, even the, we have a redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1.14, Ephesians 1, seven. Question, how did they get into Christ? How did they get into Christ so that they could have that redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ? How they could have that forgiveness of sins 
Well, Galatians 3 tells us, does it not? 26 and 27. Turn over there and take a look at it. And watch this very carefully. Galatians 3, verses 26 and follow. Paul says, For we, ye are all the children of God, by and the definite articles there, the faith in Christ Jesus. Now, let's stop for a second and think about that verse. For ye, ye who, Christians, he's talking to disciples, followers of Jesus Christ, members of the body of Christ. For ye are all the children of God. So we're talking about people who have experienced the blessing of the new birth. They've been born again, born from above. They have the ability. In fact, he's going to go on in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 to cry unto the Father, Abba, Father, by virtue of the fact they have the Spirit of God. Now, he says, you're the children of God. Here is the means by the faith, by the gospel. Where? In Christ Jesus, there's a locative construction. Again, an adverbial locative construction. Adverb of place. Location. Now he's going to explain how. Verse 27, For, because, as many of you as have been baptized, uh-oh, baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have been have put on Christ. How did they get into Christ? Well, you're baptized into Christ. Brother Paul Murphy said, some fellow one time said, well, what does that mean? How do you know that? What are you baptized in? Brother Murphy I said, buttermilk. The fellow looked at him kind of funny. He said, well, so you may as well say buttermilk is anything else other than water if that's what you want to try to avoid. Yeah, that's what these fellows try to avoid. They try to they won't say it's spirit baptism or some other kind of baptism. Well, just make it buttermilk. If you're just gonna make it up as you go along. What we read of in the New Testament concerning uh, immersion into Jesus Christ is immersion into water. The Ephesians, for instance, were cleansed with a, by the washing of with the washing of water by the word, and it wasn't the Spirit by the Spirit, as some of those guys try to read it. Water. The Hebrews writer speaks of our being washed with pure water, and that's the idea. That's what the new birth is dealing with. John three five. Born of water and of the Spirit. Not of walk, not of the Spirit and Spirit. They try to make the water the Spirit. That's a redundancy. But it was water baptism. In fact, the baptism of the Great Commission involved an immersion that was to be performed by the church. Now, Spirit baptism is administered by Jesus Christ. He's the one that will baptize you, uh, John says, in Spirit and Fire. Water baptism is administered by His disciple. And it's the baptism of the Great Commission. And by the way, it was the only baptism by the time of Ephesians 4 verse 5 because there was only one baptism at that point. So we're talking about being baptized in water to put Christ on. But when we're baptized in water and enter into Jesus Christ, the Bible says we not only put Him on, but according to Ephesians 1 7, we now have the remission of our sins. That's Acts 2.38. Isn't it wonderful how the Bible just fits together? We see John 3.5. We see Acts 2 verse 38. We see Mark 16, 15 and 16. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And all of these passages converging here in Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Now what's the end result? Watch this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. And what's this next phrase? And heirs according to the promise. Whatever the promise entailed, you're heirs of it. Paul deals with this in Romans chapter 8 when he says that those who are 
who walk after the Spirit are the children of God, verse 14, and they're heirs of uh, God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, verse 16 and 17. Joint heirs. We share in the inheritance of Jesus Christ Himself, who's the owner of everything. The universe and everything that is and everything that is to come. Brother C.R. Nickel, many years ago, back during the Great Depression, was given a diamond stick pen, I'm told. And uh, he wore that stick pen everywhere. And some dear lady in the community was a little upset. Here were all these people losing their money and C.R. Nickel walking around with a diamond stick pen. And she said, Mr. Nickel, you must think you own this world. And Brother C.R. says, My dear madam, my heavenly father does. And I'm an inheritor of it. We share in God's blessing. And one of the great aspects of it is the remission, the pardon of our sins, by which every other blessing and upon which every other blessing is contingent. If you do not have the forgiveness of your sins, you are impoverished beyond belief. But if you have the forgiveness of sins, you are an heir of the promise that was made before unto Abraham and the fathers that promise to be revealed and to be received through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you're the heir of everything. Have you ever noticed the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and following, going down through verse 12, that in every one of those there is a statement, Happy is He? King James says, Blessed are ye, or blessed is he that does such and... you ever looked at that word in the original? The word is makarios. And it's followed by the uh, definite article ha. It literally it means happy the one, blessed the one, who does thus and such. But that word makarios itself is rich in meaning because it is a word that the Greeks used of the wealthy. It's a word that the Greeks used of the wealthy. They said if they saw a man that was prosperous, well to do, and he had everything that this world could offer, they'd say that man was Macarius. And he is the Macarius one. Jesus Christ uses that of his disciples. Keep in mind that the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount really is dealing with kingdom living. It stands as the preamble to the Christian Constitution, the New Testament, and lays out for us just precisely by way of summation what Christ expects of the life of His believers, of those who would follow in His steps. And so He begins on the platform first and foremost, if you want to be blessed, if you want to be truly happy, if you want to be genuinely rich, this is what you need to do. Practice these beatitudes. Everything else will fall in place. And that's the foundational point that he makes at the very start of the great Sermon on the Mount. And then he goes into contrast. We pointed out earlier today, he contrasts the righteousness of the Pharisees with the type of righteousness that really and truly is acceptable in God's sight. That which exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, it simply does not say it goes beyond and obeys God and seeks to obey God in all things. The greatest blessing that anyone could ever have is the forgiveness of sins. That is first and foremost. But there is also involved in this a provision for future forgiveness. Look at 1 John chapter 1. John is writing and he makes the point that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And if you walk in darkness, then you're lost. You're not of God. But in Him is no darkness at all. Verse 7 points out that if we walk in the light, watch it, if ye walk in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanseth us from all sin. 
This is what in Greek is called a third class proposition or a third class condition. And what it is saying is if this is the case, if you do this, then this follows. And it always follows. It's a universal affirmative. If we walk in the light, if we keep on walking in the light, as God is the light, there's no darkness in God. We keep on walking in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship, communion, joint participation and partnership, one with another. There's the basis of fellowship, brethren. The implication of that is if you're not walking in light, or if those that are around you are not walking in light, you're to have no fellowship with them. And that's Second John nine through eleven drive, drives home that point abundantly clear. But if we walk in the light as God is in the light, and how do we know what that light is? Well, the Word of God's the light. It's the lamp to our feet, the light to our path. Psalm one nineteen verse one o five. It giveth light. Verse one thirty. That's the source. That's the information we need. That's what we need to guide, guard, direct us in life so that we can stay on the right path. We then have fellowship one with another. And keep in mind, John had said back in verses 3 and 4 that barely our fellowship was with the Father and with the Son. He said, I've written that ye may know that, ye have felt that, that your joy may be full. Now keep, it, it, keep this in mind. The, the fullness of their joy was tied to their fellowship. Their fellowship with whom? With the apostles and consequently not only with one another but also with the Father and the Son. But if you're severed from the Father and the Son then really you can have no fellowship with the apostles and you're not supposed to have fellowship with any others. That is, they're not to have fellowship with you if you're severed. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and Jesus, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanseth us, keeps on cleansing from all sin. Well, what does that entail? Does it just do it automatically? Without you doing anything? No, you've got to walk in the light, number one. You've got to keep on walking. That's a continual, continuous action. But not only that, verse 9. Brethren that say you got this automatic forgiveness, they seem to forget verse 9 is in the context. Verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and true to forgive us of our iniquities. There's a condition there too. And that is just as true and just as binding as verse 7, which shows that if it's a public, a public sin, you have to publicly confess it. Come out of it. Give it up. Not only that, but keep in mind verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. John goes on to point out that we have a, said, uh, brethren, I, uh, I've written this that you sin not. That is, don't enter into sin. But if any man does sin, if you do sin, don't give up, don't quit. Paraphrasing. We have an advocate with a Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation, the satisfaction, the mercy seat, the atonement for your sins, but for not only for your sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Well, that shows conditionality too. We have to go through Jesus Christ as a child of God for further forgiveness when we do sin. When we enter into sin, commit sin. Not only that, but there is also the condition of continued faithfulness stressed in verses 3 and 4. Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep on keeping His commandments. And that's literally how the Greek text reads. You've got to make a practice of doing the commandments of God. And so we not only have pardon from past sins, but we have future pardon available that is contingent on our faithfulness, general faithfulness in life, but also when we do sin, a repenting and confessing of that sin, a giving it up and coming back, starting over again. James five sixteen. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know some of this stuff that's going on right now in the brotherhood. We actually had a brother the other day in trying to defend 
the situation with David Miller and all of the other nonsense, trying to say that James 5.16 does not deal with confession of public sin. And that there is no passion. The Brother Act took the position there is no passion that demands public confession. Brethren, these brethren would not have defended that position ten years ago. Where have they gone to? Why are they willing to affirm clear false doctrine to hold on to Brother Miller? They're more loyal to him than they are to the book of God. And that's what it comes down to. I have seen some brethren affirm some stuff on this that I've seen brethren take and say 2 John 9 through 11 doesn't even have to do with fellowship, period. Do you know that? They've argued that. And we're talking about some well known brethren. They know better than that. They argued just as we are arguing today when they were dealing with Rubel Shelley 20 years ago. If Rubel Shelley had had half the loyalty of Dave, that Dave Miller's bunch has right now, we'd all be singing with the instrument. Or at least a good number of them. Brethren, it's serious business. Why are these brethren changing? Why have they given up the old path? Go back to Jeremiah 6, verse 16. We will not walk therein. That's why they changed their mind. This is where we are, brethren. I hate to have to deal with it. I would love to deal with just any and everything else but the problems that we're facing in the brotherhood. But it has to be dealt with at some point. We're in a serious battle for the very life of the church in this in this century. So you mean the church as we know it may disappear as far as America is concerned? Yes. Will it disappear altogether? No. As long as the Bible is around, the, the church is always there in seed form. God will preserve His Word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but My Word shall never pass away. But the Word of God is the seed of the kingdom. And where there are honest and good hearts that will receive that Word and obey it and do it, there you have the church. The church has a great work to do. We're rich in so many respects. We have the great blessings in Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Going back to that great context in which verse 7 is found, we had referred to that in whom you have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Paul says that we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All spiritual blessings pertaining to the heavenly places are located where? In Christ. There are no such blessings outside of Christ. The only place you're going to find these specific blessings are in Christ. And they include in election, that is choosing unto salvation, verse 4. Sonship, that is the new birth, verse 5. Acceptance with God, verse 6. The ability to pray to God as Father, by the way, by virtue of sonship. Think about the blessing there. Why can't an alien sinner pray through? Well, number one, the Bible doesn't teach it. Number two, he's not in a position to do it. He cannot address God as his Father because God is not his spiritual Father. So he has no basis to even begin the prayer. So he can't pray to God as Father and therefore have the appeal made known to him and know that if he asks anything according to his will that he hears him. 1 John chapter... Uh, 5, 14 and following. But we have acceptance with God, verse 6. That's Ephesians 1. We have redemption through His blood, verse 7, the forgiveness of sins. We also have knowledge, verses 8 through 10. That knowledge that is sufficient to lead us to heaven. You want to go to heaven? The knowledge is right there in the Word of God. We have the inheritance itself, heaven itself, verse 11. 
We have the praise of His glory, verse 12. We have the seal of the Spirit, verse 13. We have the Spirit as our earnest payment, down payment, verse 14. And on and on we could go. Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3 describe the wealth of the Christian. In fact, you can divide the book of Ephesians into three basic parts. Wealth, walk, and warfare. That's not original with me. I heard it in class 30 years ago here. And it wasn't original with Brother Klein. He read it in the writings of Franklin Camp. And it wasn't original with Franklin Camp. It's been in the book of God all along. The wealth, walk, and warfare of the Christian. And it is this great wealth that God has provided that serves as the foundation for the walk that we are to engage in to walk worthy of the location wherein we have been called, Ephesians 4 verse 1, and also to be ready to fight the good fight of faith, laying hold on eternal life. That we can take to ourselves the whole panoply of God. That we can be strong in His might and in the power of the Lord. And resist every advance of the devil. Ephesians 6, 10 and following. These are the blessings God's made available. These are the riches He has given. Nothing greater than itself, heaven itself. The Christian is someone who's been laying up his treasure in heaven, Matthew Chapter 6, 20 and 21. He's rich toward God as we pointed out. He not only knows that God is the Savior and the Sovereign of the earth, but He is also the Master of heaven. He understands the importance of eternity. And He is looking forward to and living His life in view of eternity. Everything is done in that perspective. Look, look at 2 Timothy 4, 6-8 through 8 as we close. Paul is writing, as I pointed out this morning, he was facing imminent death. After reminding Timothy of his obligation to preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own love shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and had told him to make full proof of his ministry and so on and to use him as an example, Paul says, for I am now ready to be offered. Literally, the idea is I'm ready to be poured out like an oblation or a drink offering on the altar of sacrifice. And the time of my departure is at hand. I'm ready to take my tent down and move on. Or I'm ready to unloose the ropes at the uh, shores of eternity and make, make sail for heaven. That's the idea. That's the end. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Notice the fact that he had accomplished these things. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, but not unto me only, but unto all those who love his appearing. Those who are living in keeping with the commandments of the Lord that are striving to be faithful to Him and do whatever He says do because He says do it. Paul was facing death. The executioner was virtually at the door. And yet he was prepared to depart this life enriched by the glorious inheritance that the great God of heaven held in store for him and for all those who love His appearing. Paul died a rich man. You think about the monster that was on the throne at the time that Paul died in A.D. 67 was a man named Nero Caesar. And I've often thought about this scenario and situation. Here is Caesar, perhaps even sitting in the booth in his box seat, watching this spectacle of the great apostle to the Gentiles being brought out and with his head being laid on the chopping block before him. Caesar, the most powerful man in the ancient world, the richest. So rich and powerful that he could take another man's wife with impunity. He just said, I want her, take her, and if you don't like it, I'll have you executed. In fact, he had even gone as far as to take another man. He had married a man. 
those folks who say a marriage is a marriage is a marriage is a marriage among our brethren. They didn't deal with that. That was Caesar. Paul's head is locked off. And without doubt, Caesar went home and rejoiced and just patted himself on the back and reveled in his riches. And by the way, while he was doing that, he was probably out in his gardens. And guess what? In those beautiful Roman gardens were torches. And those torches, or to those torches, were tied Christians that had been lit on fire to light this man's garden so he could banquet and revel and engage in all of his ungodly activity. Richest man in the world as far as this world was concerned at that time. A year later, the richest man in the world is running for his life. He is hiding. He is skulking in the bushes. He is hiding from running from building to building. And he winds up hiding in what, in, what is in effect a culvert. We would call it culvert. And he has one servant, the only man left that's loyal to him. And they're hiding out and Roman soldiers are looking to kill him. That's what happened to Nero Caesar within one year. He ends his life by having his servant. He doesn't even have the courage himself. He has his servant thrust him through with a, a sword and saying, Thus die the greatest actor in Rome. That's Nero. Richest man on earth! But really, the richest man on earth had died a year before and was winging his way into eternity. What would you like to be when this life is over? Would you like to be like the rich man of Luke 16 or would you like to be Lazarus? I think when we look at that account of things. I don't believe it's a parable. I think it's an account of a real event. Believe it. In fact, I know it is. You take that record and look at the condition of things of Lazarus after death as opposed to before death and I don't believe anyone here would hesitate to say I want to be Lazarus. The reality of it in life, the rich man was the poor man. And Lazarus even though poor physically, was the rich man. The richest man on earth. Because he died faithful to his Lord. Revelation 14, 13. Blessed, there's happy, rich. There's Macarius Ha. Blessed are they who die in the Lord henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. That's the condition of Lazarus. What about you? Are you subject to the invitation? Are you in need of being baptized for the mission of sins to put Christ on, to receive that remission so you can have the promise of future blessing in heaven itself? Or are you a child of God that needs to confess sin and come home as a broken sinner? Coming out of that, making right with your life, and going on in your service to the Lord. Whatever your need, we plead with you, we beg you to come. While together we stand and sing.